a lot of our conservative friends still have a fundamental postmodern commitment to the subjectivism of truth. So that if I say, um, this is my view on this, and then someone else challenges that view publicly, then I say, I'm hurt that you've attacked me. What do you mean you've attacked me? You've attacked my idea. That's fine. You should attack my ideas if they're poor. But you haven't attacked me because I'm not truth. Welcome to Scalay Sisters, where we are cultivating the maximum number of thinking moms we can. This is the podcast for classical homeschooling mamas who yearn for something more than just checking boxes and getting it all done. Scalay Sisters discusses topics that matter to those of us who believe that educating ourselves through reading widely, thinking deeply, and applying faithfully equips us for the task of educating our children. I'm your host, Brandi Venzel. To get my free, almost weekly, mostly Charlotte Mason newsletter, go to afterthoughtsblog.net slash subscribe and sign up. My co-host today is Misty Winkler. Misty is a homeschooling mom of five, including two graduates. She writes and podcasts at simplyconvivial.com and is the author of The Convivial Homeschool. Our guest today is Chad Vegas. Chad is the founding pastor of Sovereign Grace Church in Bakersfield, California, where he has served since 2006. Chad received his MA from Talbot School of Theology. He also spent nearly two decades in public school education as both a teacher and a board member. He has been married to Teresa since 1994, and they have two children. Have you registered for our fall online local retreats yet? Our hostess kits are sold out, but digital hostess kits are still available. Our annual Homeschool Essentials Retreat always takes a deep dive into one aspect of homeschooling. This year's topic is time, the most essential part of homeschooling of all. We cannot wait to spend time with you all on Saturday, October 7th, so mark your calendars. Go to scolysisters.com slash time. That's scolysisters.com slash T-I-M-E to register. Today's conversation kicks off with Pastor Chad's interpretation of Matthew 18. What does it really mean, and how do you know if it's being abused or misused? After that, we dig deeply into the topic of public conversation and where Christians can and should draw lines. You are going to love this discussion. And so, without further ado, let's get to it. Let's start off with our school A every day. Misty, why don't you go first and show us how we do it? Yeah, I just finished. I'm choosing a book I have actually finished and not just started. Good job. (laughs) Way to follow I do finish books. Uh, Crossing to Safety, a novel by Wallace Stegner. Never heard of him. A friend recommended this book to me. So I got the Audible version and just listened to it. It reminded me why I don't often choose novels. You you just get caught up in the story grip mm. and it's like, oh, I just lost touch with my life. But it was a good novel and one I would read again to oh. kind of catch what was actually going on. It's about marriage and friendship. It's just a really fascinating character study. The people are very rich and deep. And it's set in, let's say I'd say the 30s to the 70s. So that kind of generation. Interesting. But it's not really about, you know, the Depression or World War II or anything like that. It's about these people and those social circumstances just are incidental to their lives. Hmm. So anyway, it, it was, it's just a really interesting book. Could it be shared with teenagers? Yes or no? Um, It would depend on the teenager, okay. for sure. Because... I would say it is about these two marriages specifically. So I think you get the most out of it when you yourself are married. And then that means that there is a a sexual component to it as well. Nothing graphic. Good. Glad I asked. (laughs) (laughs) Glad I asked. (laughs) Well, Chad, what about you? What have you been reading? Um, Well, you know, I have odd reading habits. So I... (laughs) I read in a variety of disciplines and I tend to do three pages a day in each discipline so that I make it through just over a thousand pages of discipline per year. I did not know that. That's fascinating. Whoa. 
Yeah, yeah. It's just kind of how I approach it. So the city of God I'm reading right now, it's kind mm-hmm. of one of the historic books I'm reading. Obviously, as Augustine addresses the fall of Rome to Alaric and the barbarians and the charges that were being brought against Christians, that somehow this is this is the fault of Christianity. And so that's been excellent. Hmm. And as far as teenagers reading, uh, if, if that's going to be a question based on what I just heard, <laughs> the, uh, Carl Truman had told me to read this translation. It's called The Translation for the 21st Century. And uh, I, th- I think a teenager could read this. In fact, the introduction by the translator, William Babcock, is excellent. His introduction is excellent and helpful in locating it historically to read. So interesting. So that's a new translation of City of God. Yeah, it's a translate. It's called a translation for the 21st century. They're doing all of Augustine's works. And I picked it up oh. because I'm not a, I, I don't read Latin as a normal thing. I barely read it at all. But mm-hmm. um, Carl Truman reads Latin like he reads English. And he told me he really likes this translation. So, oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then I'm reading like in other areas. So a history of philosophy by Peter Kreeft, that could definitely called Socrates children. There's four volumes that could definitely be read by a teen, maybe even a junior higher. I was just eyeing that series on Amazon. I was too. (laughs) It's excellent. It's really helpful. There's a few pages per philosopher as he moves through the various philosophers in each period, ancient, etc. And so he has really compact, helpful explanations of them and certain challenges to each one that he brings to the table. It's It would be really worth reading just to walk through. It's Again, it's a survey, and it's a survey in an intellectual history form. You're not, you know, you're just hearing the thoughts of each of these individuals. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then Needham's 2,000 Years of Christ Powers, Nick Needham's 2,000 oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. five volumes also something teenagers could read that's why i pulled it out because i thought what what could parents have their kids read this is readable by a teen no problem to go through the history of the church so misty didn't you do that with your boys i think it's only four volumes then though right i was gonna say is does that mean the fifth volume is out the fifth volume is out and yeah so hopefully a sixth will be coming soon there's a lot of information in those they're really good but it's like wow Firehose. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> and they have little samples from each period. So when he's covering a period, when Needham's covering a period, he pulls out little sample readings from those guys. And so that's, you know, so you get some primary resource reading, which is is good. It's just very introductory though. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Mm-hmm. Now, and there's others, but that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, mine is called A Failure of Nerve by Edwin Friedman. It's a leadership book. I actually sent this to the new headmaster at our school because I was like, I know you're really tired of leadership books and I know that you always say you hate them, but this is the best one I've ever read. Anyway, I I could go on and on about this book. In fact, to Misty privately today, I have gone on and on (laughs) and also on. It was funny. I was in this discussion online with some people about classroom management in classical education and... I couldn't seem to get them away from basically behaviorism, the whole stimulus response approach. Not that there's no such thing as us responding to stimulus, but just like a really heavy handed manipulative type of classroom management. And it was really interesting in reading this book, which how far am I? I guess I'm about halfway now. Anyway, he keeps talking about how with leadership, first and foremost, your power or control of the room lies in your presence rather than any particular method that you're using. And I thought that I think is why it bothers me so much when we're having these conversations. These classical teachers are insisting that we need to borrow from modern philosophy and how we manage children. But actually, I'm pretty sure the reason why they're so insistent is because they've already lost the battle. They already don't have any authority when they walk in the room, which And my experience, especially with women sometimes, is that they don't even know how to speak to a child in an authoritative way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had to learn that with my youngest, who was pretty sure everything I said was a question. And so it was optional. (laughs) And so he took the option of no. Uh, (laughs) So he called me on that one. Anyway, it's been such a good book on leadership. And I will not go on and on. But I do recommend it for moms. If you're struggling with leading your homeschool, might be a good read. 
Hi, Abby here to tell you about Sistership. Sistership is the place for homeschooling moms to ask questions and share tried and true principles from years of experience. We have thoughtful, intelligent, thinking moms that read widely, think deeply, and faithfully apply what they learn. We tackle serious topics, but don't take ourselves too seriously. We value educational principles over products and we'll always be ad-free and drama-free because we refuse to take offense at differing opinions. We seek truth, goodness, and beauty and would love for you to join us in Sistership. It's free. Come for the encouragement and stay for the fun. All right. I titled today's discussion Division or Dialogue because I really want us to discuss what I consider to be the number one scriptural passage that is used to shut down controversial conversations. <laughs> and that's Matthew 18. Which is Brandy's conversations online. Pretty much. <laughs> People throw this at me quite often. <laughs> Matthew 18, 15 through 20. And all of us, I'm sure, have seen this passage abused many times. But I was even thinking about covering this just because Schooly Sisters does own a private social media network for classical homeschooling moms. And so it's never been used this way in that context, but I still feel like it's good for us to keep in mind what the limits are of this passage and what it does and does not say about especially public conversation. So we really do want to hold ourselves and by extension our members to the correct standard, but it can be confusing about what that standard is because of how misused this passage often is. Mm -hmm. That's why we brought you here, Chad, because you're a pastor, you're my pastor, so we want to know, can you explain the basic process outlined in Matthew 18 and explain what it is actually for? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's important that we understand, you know, going to the text, right? So we can talk about sort of throwing out platitudes where we've not bothered to actually look at the text itself mm -hmm. to see if we're getting it right. But if you notice in Matthew 18, 15, it starts out, if your brother sins against you, Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. I just want to start off by saying there's a sense here in which, well, not a sense, we're talking about sin. So we're not talking about distinct philosophical ideas. It doesn't say, you know, if your brother is making a different wisdom call than you, right? If he right. sins against you. So we can we can talk about a variety of philosophies. I mean, it you know, if I run into a guy who's more a nominalist as opposed to a realist, which uh, without getting into the depths of that philosophical understanding, I think nominalism is a real problem. Mm. Uh, but I don't think because a guy purports nominalism publicly and I I disagree with him publicly that we're that he's sinned against me nor I him. I mean, depending on how that public conversation goes, I suppose. I mean, I, I suppose if <laughs> it I devolves said, later. Yeah, yeah. If it devolves. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But he goes and says, go to him alone. And then it says, but if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Now that's pushing us back to Deuteronomy. And the context, obviously, with Deuteronomy is a context of you've got someone who's committed a kind of crime in Israel. And you're, you're going out there saying, because you've committed this crime, I'm charging you with committing a crime. And they're saying, you know, you can't, issue the death penalty in the context without um, the evidence of two or three eyewitnesses. People need to have seen this crime. Can't just be one guy's word against another as to whether some sort of offense has been committed that might lead to your execution. That's what he's quoting here. Hmm. Um, this isn't like, hey, if you heard some gossip, take two or three others along with you and you know involve them in the gossip as well. <laughs> this is prosecuting someone who won't repent for sin and you're bringing forward witnesses to that sin. Or, I mean, I suppose if the person has committed that sin in a public fashion, then, you know, you're, you're probably bringing forward witnesses to their um, lack of repentance in that sense, because nobody's disputing whether it actually happened. But the context here is that there's some dispute as to whether or not the thing happened. Hmm. And the reason I get at that is, you know, when, when I go online and I post a sermon that I've preached online, or I stand up in the pulpit and preach a sermon on Sunday, or I put a thought on Facebook or something, I'm participating in public speech, right? And I'm making yeah. public arguments. 
hopefully I'm not sinning against anybody. <laughs> I suppose if I'm putting out error, maybe somebody could argue that I am in that sense sinning. But my point is, I don't think someone needs to take me aside privately at that point. In fact, as a church leader, interestingly enough, in 1 Timothy 5, 19, if I'm committing sin and there are two or three witnesses of that sin, um, that I'm supposed to be rebuked publicly before all so that all might stand afraid. Hmm. So the, the notion that that should be private is somewhat nonsensical. But if you go through this, the point is, if he refuses, you bring the along witness, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Well, he's talking here about church discipline for unrepentant sin, like a kind of gross unrepentant sin that just continues. You discipline them, and you when you treat them as a, or yeah, we treat them as a Gentile or tax collector, you're essentially saying they're outside the community. They're, they're being treated as one who's not inside, but one who's outside. We can see that language in 1 Corinthians 5 when Paul deals with a sinner there and says, you got to put him out. He goes by the name of brother, but actually his lifestyle is so wicked and he's, he's unrepentant, so you put him out of the community and you treat him like an unbeliever. Now, by the way, just to clarify, I'm not, I'm not an Anabaptist, so I don't, I'm not a guy who believes in shunning where you treat him like an unbeliever means you never talk to him again. Mm-hmm. But, but like you treat an unbeliever, you're not communing with the church anymore. You're not a member of the church. Your profession of Christ is hypocrisy, and we're going to call you to faith and repentance. So this is excommunication. Excommuning. You're no longer communing, yeah. right? And so that's the context. I don't know what that has to do with someone teaching publicly things that you might be challenging. The only time we'd be talking about excommunication in the context of someone doing public teaching that's errant uh, would be in the case of someone teaching what you might call heterodox or divisive doctrine contrary to that that the church holds, at which point, you know, Titus 1 tells us to rebuke that man sharply. You know, Second Timothy, First and Second Timothy both deal with that as well, where like Hymenaeus and Alexander are publicly called out by Paul in the book. Right. In Galatians, Paul calls out Paul and Barnabas. I mean, sorry, Peter calls out Paul and Barnabas. I man, I'm reversing this. Paul calls out Peter and Barnabas. <laughs> <laughs> Paul calls out Peter and Barnabas, and and what's he doing? He's saying, well, they were they were allying themselves with with Judaizers, and so they were they were really causing issues with their profession of faith in the gospel of God's grace. He did that publicly in a New Testament letter. So the notion that these men, because they believe in church discipline being a private process for a private sin, that they, because they believe that, that somehow they believe when public error is being taught or public ideas are being shared, that that ought to be a private challenge as well. I just don't find that anywhere in the scriptures. We'd have to toss out all the prophets if we believed that. <laughs> well, it seems to me that it really it's used to shut down controversial conversation. I want to be careful because I don't think it's always the censorship crowd doing this. I think sometimes it's people who are just very uncomfortable with difficult conversations. And so they'd rather them not happen, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because usually what follows very closely on the feet of that one is this idea of causing division. So now it's divisive to talk about, I don't know. I mean, really like opinions. My thing is just, I actually don't want to start church discipline against someone because I disagree with them on something that's truly an opinion. Right. And this is why I I think, Brandy, what you're talking about is a lot of our conservative friends still have a fundamental postmodern commitment to the subjectivism of truth. So that if I say, um, this is my view on this, and then someone else challenges that view publicly, then I say, I'm hurt that you've attacked me. What do you mean you've attacked me? You've attacked my idea. That's fine. You should attack my ideas if they're poor. But you haven't attacked me because I'm not truth, right? I'm, <laughs> I'm sharing an idea. So I don't, I don't think people understand how much they've if you will, they're swimming in the waters of the culture in the way that we see the concept of truth in general and how Mm -hmm. uncomfortable we are in challenging each other in the kinds of things we say are truth. The other thing I think to keep in mind is as a Protestant, we believe in, I believe in, and I, I know you do, sola scriptura. So scripture alone is our authority. 
which means we don't have any popes. We don't have any men who, if you will, can somewhat be claimed to be infallible or unassailable as the head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. The scripture is our authority, which gives a kind of liberty of conscience. And that's why the Protestant reformers most of the time put a chapter on liberty of conscience in their confessions, because they're saying, hey, if this isn't directly taught in scripture or by good and necessary consequence derived from scripture, then you're free to have your own view on it. And no one can bind your conscience on that. That seems to have been lost as well. Hmm. So that we have talking heads. You can't challenge them, right? You can't. They, they, they kind of rise to a level of a sort of papacy in whatever field they're in. And it, if you challenge them, you're being divisive as if they're the fount of truth, right? And that, that, that really concerns me. Is that kind of like Fauci saying that he is science? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It does sound a lot like that, doesn't it? But yeah. self-proclaimed Pope of Science. <laughs> well, but I think that's happening all over the place, frankly. Right. You you hear it all the time, like a, a pastor or, or a leader in some field says something, they make an argument, and then you come along and disagree, and they're like, Well, who do you think you are? You know, I've been doing this for however long, and I have these degrees and whatever. And you're like, well, I, I don't think I'm anybody spectacular. I'm just saying I think you're wrong, and here's why. And I don't care how many credentials you have. That doesn't determine whether or not you're telling the truth. Hmm. I don't care how, how battle-worn you are in this thing. That doesn't determine whether or not you're telling the truth, right? Is what you're saying true or is it false? And if you're going to publish it publicly, then you are doing so because you're inviting public analysis and scrutiny of your idea. That's what you're doing. So I wrote a book. There have been lots of critiques of it. There's an academia online and you see your name. It tells me every time someone critiques me, right? <laughs> <I get it. laughs> so fun. Send that direct to my email. <laughs> yeah, it does. It comes right to my email. I don't care if all kinds of people are publishing critiques of my book. I wrote it. I put it out in the public sphere. I'm a grown man. If I don't like it, then, then I shouldn't publicly put out ideas. Right. Right. I don't I don't think one of the people owe me an apology for not calling me personally first. I called none of them beforehand and said, I'm going to publish this book. Are you OK with it? <laughs> I didn't do. That. Oh, that could have been amusing. <laughs> OK, so my question is, when we're talking about, for example, our smaller social media platform that we personally own. Mm -hmm. And I, I do not think we have a problem with division. But as we grow, it's always something that's on our mind. What does it actually mean to cause division? How do we guard against divisiveness, both as participants, but also as those who are moderating this thing? I feel like the definition of division is so convoluted that then it's hard to discern when something even has crossed a line because everyone's so uncomfortable with forthright conversation. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have a number of biases, one of them, which is whoever speaks first is not being divisive. It's just the people who challenge that that are being divisive. I don't know where we got that rule from, <laughs> but speaking first publicly does not make you the non-divisive one, mm. right? If we have a body of truth as Christians we hold to, and you're the first one to challenge that as some kind of heterodox idea that you put out there, you are the divisive one, right? You're the divisive one, not the people who come back and say, wait a minute, that's heterodoxy. So just in the field of theology, I'm saying, yeah, we have a body of accepted truth, like Jesus as God and man, one person, two natures. If Apollinarius, historic heretic, comes along and says, I'm going to post something on social media about this, why I, I don't think he really has um, a human soul in the sense that we talk about now. And he posts that on social media and I call him out and say, hey, that's not that's not right. You've you've misunderstood Christian orthodoxy and actually the Bible's teaching, and that's that's a problematic view. I'm not the divisive one. He's the one who's come out just because he spoke first. So that's one issue. I think anything not a, in accord with the doctrine the church holds obviously would be divisive to teach out of accord with that. Now, your guys' online forum doesn't just include people from like our church, right, Brandy? So mm -hmm. that, nope, ecumenical, yeah. Right. And so then what do you do? Well, there are ecumenical doctrines, if you will, that we all hold to, you know, that we find in the, the historic creeds of the church. Mm -hmm. So if they teach outside of those, that would be disconcerting. But beyond that, I, I think unless they're, you know, cussing each other out or or calling each other names or questioning each other's 
intelligence or veracity as to their character, I don't see why having debates about these issues is divisive. With that said, I think a lot of people get on social media and they act like they're drunk, right? They they <laughs> they say things to each other on social media that they would never say to someone face to face unless they had too much alcohol in their system, hmm. right? And that that is concerning. So I'm hearing you say things like personal attacks, foul language, maybe generally angry responses, um, attributing motives. Undermining what is received Christian orthodoxy. Those all things, okay. those would all be, be would be division. In the negative, in the in the, in the sense that you're you're causing division sinfully. There's a kind of division that's good, right? So when you're telling the truth and people divide over the truth, that division is not, you've done nothing wrong by telling the truth and quote unquote causing division because it's the one who rejects the truth that is the one dividing. Hmm not the one telling the truth. So I think that's an important caveat to keep in mind. You're not divisive because you tell the truth. And in the sense that people mean when they use the word, you are divisive in the sense that Jesus talks about, you know, I came to bring a sword. There is a divisiveness that occurs by the proclamation of the truth of the offense of the gospel. That that does happen. Or the proclamation of the law. So in our current co context, if I stand up and say, God has created male and female as two complementary sexes. That's now like being divisive, right? Yeah. In the current context. I think that's that's nonsense that that's divisive. That's just stating what we all know. It's obvious. I don't even have to read a Bible to know that. It's obvious <laughs> it's in nature, <laughs> right? So, right. So I guess my question is how we apply this to more secular conversations. I mean, we do have in the context of the sistership, which is what our social media platform is called, we do have on occasion more religious type discussions. But I'm thinking even, you know, philosophical debates or political, yeah. you know, is there a type of unhealthy causing division that should be guarded against without shutting down conversation entirely? Yeah, it's not like there's a received orthodoxy for which math curriculum you used. <laughs> Correct. Well, although, although there are people in homeschool and classical school circles who think there are. Yes. There is, Isn't that the truth? <laughs> it, it is. And obviously we all have to fight against that. But yeah, I think that's it's an important point. In principle, it's not distinct. Well, first of all, if you're talking about should we be using this math curriculum or that math curriculum, should you homeschool or be in a private school or what have you, there's no way I can imagine applying Matthew 18, 15 and following to that person, right? Well, I'm going to have to bring you up for charges before my church for your wickedness and using Saxon math, you know, like what? <laughs> I won't repent of the spiral method of math. You know, so, I, do, I don't, you know, that that's crazy. So I, I do think we, we get into more important political discussions. I can tell you where I think it becomes somewhat divisive in a political way on social media, particularly. So let's say you're a part of the pro-life movement, which I was for some time. And now there's this kind of abolitionist movement mm -hmm. that's happening. And I'm watching, particularly, I see it more on the social media. I'm not saying... I have some calculation of who insults who more. But what I, what I see on social media, limited to that, is a lot of the abolitionists are basically like, pro-lifers don't really care about babies and they don't care if they die and they're choosing this kind of thing. And I'm like, what are you people? Yeah, you have a different method as to how to reach the same end. And your method and approach might be right and theirs might be wrong, but you don't need to disparage them as human beings. And every time they post something, you need to go in and argue with them about it. Right. Like there's a point at which, hey, engaging a conversation at one level is fine. But if you're just constantly nagging and you've said it over and over and over, you just keep doing it. You're just relentless. At some point, it's just like you need to grow up. Right. You, you need to get over it. You're not the Holy Spirit. You're not going to change people. State what you what you think is true. Argue for it and move along. Well, it seems like there's a difference then that's happening between discussing an idea and dialoguing 
versus jumping to slander as a way like slander doesn't make a point. Yeah. So I would <laughs> tell people, you know, as a Christian, check your heart. If you're, if you're not actually an honest broker, when you're having this kind of conversation online, if you really are sort of ticked off and wanting to find ways to gently jab this person rather than trying to win them to the truth, which is different in motive. Mm. I want to show I'm right. That's pride. I want to win this person to the truth. That's good. You know your own heart in that, even though you might be able to disguise it online and make yourself look very sweet and pleasant. And really you're not. Mm. I mean, that, that could be happening, but we just need to assume the best about each other, have these discussions. And when we have these debates, have them with the goal, not of defeating the other person, but of winning them to the truth. Mm, I really like that. And I think that applies even with math curricula. (laughs) Because when, when we're prideful about something like that, that's when we cling to this way as the only way. Versus if we're really concerned philosophically, it seems like there's more of a desire to discuss the ideas behind, you know, one curriculum versus another or one method versus another or something like that. Well, yeah. And Brandy, you know, you've heard this in church. I'll give you an example of how it can be divisive. So, cause you've heard me say this in a group before, not from the pulpit, I don't think, mm-hmm. but in a group, at least you've heard me comment about how homeschool moms, a lot of times in the church, we have a lot of them, the majority, I think of our moms do that. And they can have a, a subtle way of guilting each other of saying, well, um, in, in your case, so you do this kind of classical education, Charlotte Mason, what have you. Right. And you, mm-hmm. you, you love her. You, you kind of follow that road. Okay. And then I've never seen Brandy do this. I just want to be clear for you. <laughs> Throw me under the bus, Chad. As, 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 as an example, if you were sitting with other moms and they were like, well, we have our kids at this Christian school or my kids doing a Becca homeschool or some curriculum or whatever. And you were like, well, that's wrong and you should repent. That'd be a problem. But there's a yeah. more subtle way to do it. You could be like, well, we use Charlotte Mason because we really love our children. (laughs) (laughs) I I see women do that to each other. What are you doing? Wow. That's a, that's a kind of different way to come at being, if you will, divisive in your, your approach. Just and pondering people, all the little unloved Becca children out there. Um, well, exactly. <laughs> Those poor kids. Yeah, really? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, but you know, you see it. That's the way people try to make their point because they want to win by almost any means. And one of them is that we're really good at is guilting and shaming each mm-hmm. other. If you're not quite where I am. Look, the command is clear. Raise your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Yeah. The means to doing that, getting them in the word, praying, having them in the church, we can talk about all that, you know, disciplining them, et cetera. But then sort of what form that takes with their upbringing, whether it's homeschool or sending them to the private classical school or whatever, the Bible doesn't address that. And so we can give our opinions, but we need to be really clear that it doesn't have any more weight than, than this is our family's wisdom call, right? Yeah. And here's why. And if you want my wisdom, let me tell you why we do it this way. And if that's helpful, fantastic. You know, yeah. so- Yeah. Sometimes I think our desire to have other people do what we're doing is because we aren't exactly confident in our own choices. Mm -hmm. Like we need affirmation from other people choosing the same thing as us. And so then someone choosing to do something different can feel like an attack when in no way is it an attack at all. But because we're not confident in our own choices or philosophy or whatever, then we interpret it that way. But that's not what's actually going on. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that kind of behavior is generally driven by a sort of insecurity. Yeah, I think it's true. I remember that used to be something I experienced regularly when we first chose to homeschool, that if I said that we were homeschooling to someone who was public schooling, it, it was funny, even if they weren't offended necessarily, they would start defending their choice. Mm-hmm. Yep. But I never said anything about public school. I had just simply said we were going to homeschool. And I was always taken aback by that, that just somehow by me choosing something different, they assumed 
that I thought that they were horrible people or horrible parents, which I mean, I I hadn't even really thought about their choices. <laughs> so I, I didn't have an opinion uh, anyway, but it was an interesting phenomenon and it happened over and over again to the point where I wanted to not tell people that we homeschooled because I didn't want them to feel bad. I didn't like that me saying our choice made them feel guilty for their choices. Yeah. Strange. Which is one way that that kind of insecurity shuts down conversation. I guess that's true. Yeah. I was in my 20s, so I was a little more gun shy. (laughs) Well, and Brandy, that was a while ago. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) I know because I'm so old now. Things things have changed. Things have changed. Well, I mean, you know, homeschooling, when I was a youth pastor, you know, 23 years ago, I had very few of my youth and my youth group were homeschooled. Very few. And they were, they, they didn't have to tell you they were homeschooled. They were publicly identifiable when I walked. <laughs> right? And their moms were too, because you're pretty sure as soon as she got done with the bedspread or tablecloth, she made a dress out of it. So, <laughs> you know, and so you just knew those are the homeschoolers. Now that's dramatically shifted yeah, in the last 20 plus years where the people come in the church and more likely than not, the conservative folks are homeschooling, not always because they have a you know, conviction that homeschooling is the best option, but because it's, th- it's the best one they can afford. Yeah. yeah. You know, so they can't afford the private school. So they're like, but we don't want our kid in the public school because those have gone somewhat crazy. So this is what we're going to do. And it's pretty normalized comparatively. Mm-hmm. It is. I, I grew up homeschooled. So my favorite compliment as a high schooler was, what? You don't look homeschooled. <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, it's true. It's true. Yeah. And, and that's, I think, changed so much. It has. Now mm-hmm. the fights I hear are, are on issues like which approach to academic, you know, education, homeschooling is the best. And should you use a state charter program or is mm-hmm. that a violation of something you know so you get in i hear those debates more than anything else now okay so that's an interesting one though because that is one that i would say still is the charter school issue still is very divisive in the homeschool community where there are groups where if you are in a charter school they do not want anything to do with you and they will say things like And by the way, I politically, I sympathize with what they're saying. So I'm not even saying that they're wrong. But they will say things like, well, because you're receiving government funds, we cannot associate with you. But they mean that in a very broad way. They don't mean you can't come to this particular class because we don't take government funds. But if you paid for it privately, you could. They mean like a form of shunning. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that is it has been a really interesting thing to me because it seems like some of the things you're talking about when it comes to persuading to to your perspective, by letting someone spend private funds on your class, that might be the first step to wooing them away from that government money. Yeah. Like if they had a good experience or something. Yeah. Well, and so now you're getting into, you know, sort of wisely, how do we go about making this kind of thing happen? You know, I yeah. when we first started homeschooling our kids, we heard about this Valley Oaks Charter School in Bakersfield. And so we're like, oh, well, let's do that. And so we did that. And then my wife heard about a a play group because our kids were, you know, four and six or something. She heard about a play group of homeschool kids during the week and she wanted to go. So she contacted them and they just straight told her, well, your kids are at Valley Oaks. And she said, oh yeah, we use them. And they said, yeah, you your kids can't play with our kids. Um, and it was like, wow, you know, that's seriously, they can't even play together. Uh, no, 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 because you're taking government funds. And and the other thing was, and you're not giving them a Christian education, which wasn't actually true because we could buy our own curriculum. The, the government only bought the curriculum that was quote unquote neutral, right? Whatever that means. But it was just an odd reaction to to that. I don't actually disagree that it's. it seems like, for example, in the state of California, we're making strong moves to kind of take homeschooling over at the government level. Yeah. And so I understand and sympathize with the perspective that essentially everybody's opening the door to give the government control of homeschooling. Yeah. I, I sympathize with that. But what? why are their children now lepers? Right? I don't right. understand that. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't understand why Christians, by the way, 
won't let their children play with the children of unbelievers. I mean, we're, com- we're commanded to love our neighbor and to share the gospel. And if you're going to raise your children in a context where, they, where they're never around unbelievers, I don't mean your children sharing the gospel with children. But look, I mean, the most natural relationships you're going to have um, where you have a chance to do evangelism are either going to be coworkers or parents of other children. Mm. And so here they are. Well, you're not going to have any relationships with them. And then you're going to wonder why no one's coming to Christ. It's not hard to figure out, right? You, you, you're not going to lead people to Christ if you don't have any relationships with any unbelievers. So we've actually moved beyond that, though. We're not even saying we're not going to associate with unbelievers. We're not going to associate with believers who don't homeschool the way we do. Like, that's crazy to me. So it's purity testing. <laughs> it is purity testing. That's exactly right. It's a kind of fundamentalism that is um, very exclusive, now, this wouldn't preclude, for example, a co-op that's very specific. So no. if you're Catholic, you have a Catholic co-op, or if you are a, like classical, you have a classical co-op or something like that, right? No, I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. I'm not suggesting that every organized group has to be inclusive of all views and ideas and thoughts not at all, at yeah. all. I'm just talking about the way Christians interact with each other yeah. relationally. You know, so, so my kids couldn't play with the children of people who were members of the church at which I was a pastor, right? <laughs> Sorry, your kids, our kids can't play with the pastor's kids. We're not sure if they're pure enough for us, you know? So, I mean, like, they should have Matthew 18 you at that point. <laughs> yeah, they should have. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's what I'm getting at. That's a very different thing than, hey, you have a co-op that is very specifically, let's say, Protestant, Reformed, and and uh, classical, and that's what we're doing here. That's fine, great. That's your that's what you're doing, right? But when we're at the park, we're not going to be like, "Are you classical?" Yeah, give out little wristbands for the kind of <laughs> right. only play with the children with the red wristband. <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! This world that we live in. Okay, so. I'm glad we have time for this. I feel like we have time for our rabbit trails because I put some down in case we did. So I'm just going to read all three of them because I do think they actually all go together. But I feel like there's this huge amount of pressure also in public discussion. And I find this to happen a lot with women. I guess maybe it happens with men also. But like, if you say things that people don't like in certain ways, you get accused of, for example, not being winsome or being mean unkind yeah unkind mean spirited and so i was wondering like does the bible somewhere require winsomeness as part of a public discussion you know is the babylon bee in violation of this winsomeness requirement you know get, like can we engage in satire as christians like is that permissible or, or where winsome means you have not hurt anyone's feelings and when instead maybe the conversation should be about whether or not your feelings ought to have been hurt <laughs> uh, it's a kind of odd, it's it's almost like it's it's a new beatitude, blessed are the winsome, right? So <laughs> to be winsome is to be essentially generally pleasing. You're generally mm-hmm. pleasing, right? So do I think it's good to try not to be generally unpleasing? Sure, <laughs> sure. Like nobody should be striving to be unpleasing, you know, but we've turned it into this ultimate virtue in which we've reversed the second greatest commandment. You know, the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. We've reversed it to winsomely get your neighbor to love you as yourself, right? So Mm. that's not the command, (laughs) not get the world to love me. It's love them. And sometimes you love people and they don't feel loved by it. It doesn't matter. You're not commanded to get the world to love you. You're commanded to love the world. Those are different things. And mm. by the world here, I mean the human beings, not the world system. Obviously, we yeah. should have that love of the world. So unfortunately, it's become sort of the key characteristic of public engagement that you have to be generally pleasing. I want to say, well, if that's true, then people haven't read James 2, where James is really sarcastic. Uh, you believe there's one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. You know, when he says you do well, you're doing just as well as the demons. That's not exactly 
pleasing. It's not nice. That's not nice. <laughs> no. Or Matthew 23, when Jesus tells the scribes and Pharisees, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, and then just rips them for a whole chapter. I don't think any of them thought, wow, this is winsomeness right here. You know, that <laughs> Jesus was not being winsome. There are times when Jesus or the apostles are not winsome. There are times when God is not winsome. And I mean, I understand that Jesus is God, you know, taking humanity to himself. But if you just think directly about the book of Job, the Lord goes on for chapter after chapter and just rips Job until he shuts his mouth. You were not, you did you set the limit for the seas? Did you? It's all dripping with sarcasm. Of course, Job knows he didn't do any of it. So he stops his mouth. All I'm saying is, how would we if we're going to place that at such a high level, how would we account for what we see in scripture? You know, mm-hmm. Elijah, the prophets of Baal. Uh, where's your God right now? Maybe he's defecating, right? Like <laughs> that doesn't sound winsome. <laughs> so you, you can see what I think about winsomeness. So then Babylon B, because I've heard people actually say that they just think they're so out of line, you know, like more than half of the time, because I don't know, they're not nice. So rude so rude yeah well i mean i think the babylon bee is fantastic so (laughs) (laughs) do i think everything they put out is funny no but man they're funny a lot and i think part of the problem right now is because we've become so politically correct we've killed comedy there's there's Mm. there's no ability to mock what is insane in our lives and culture christians would do themselves a service if they took god and his word deadly seriously and they took themselves not seriously at all Mm -hmm. Um, i need to be able to laugh at myself and my own stupidity and the stupidity of my culture while at the same time taking the lord really seriously Mm. i kind of wonder if those things even go together that as we take god less seriously we take ourselves more seriously probably you know how do you account for psalm 2 uh, you know, the nations rage and the people's plot in vain. They set themselves or take counsel together against the Lord and his Messiah, the anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart, cast their cords away from us. And it's the response to that is the Lord holds them in derision. He who sits in the heavens laughs. He's He's mocking them. So if the Lord can laugh at our insanity, right? Mm-hmm. To say that's an ungodly behavior to mock the insanity of wicked and foolish culture is to say that God is ungodly Hmm. to be godly is to be like him. Hmm. So he mocks it. I guess the Babylon bee decided to make it their business to do the same. (laughs) (laughs) So what about uh, poking fun gently or not at another Christian? Cause that's God, you know, mocking unbelievers. Yeah. I, I think the question is whether or not you have the, to some degree, the relationship to do it, but mm. you can mock you can you can mock sin. Um, I mean, I'm not talking about mocking unbelievers directly. Like, let me go out and mock our oh, right. president, yes. our president or something. But let me mock you know some of the claims of the transgender movement. I mean, they're insane. Yeah. If you can't mock that stuff, I don't know what you're left with. You're going to go crazy, I suppose, <laughs> because you you're not even in the world of serious argumentation anymore. Yeah. You're talking about people who think men can be women. That's crazy. And you have to be able to mock that. But that's distinct from I meet a particular person who holds that position and I mercilessly mock them, right? Right. Yes. I I think those are distinct things, one. And two, when we're talking about our Christian brothers and sisters, obviously, if I'm going to direct it toward a particular individual, then I better have the right relationship with them to be able to do that, I think. It's wise that I have the right relationship. If I'm going to direct it to a Christian cultural goofiness of some kind, I think that's perfectly fine. So, I mean, I I made a joke earlier about old school homeschoolers and, you know, jean jumpers and whatever, right? That they they were obvious when they walked in a room. Well, so I'm just mocking something that became some kind of weird cultural fundamentalism, right? You've heard me do this before. I joke about how Every October 31st, my family celebrates Reformation Day. And we do it by putting our kids in costumes and going next door to ask for candy. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and because people 
people think, you know, oh, if you put your kids in a costume and you take them next door and ask for candy, you know, I don't know, you're participating in Satanism or something. That's silly. My kids have never come home with Reese's peanut butter cups while they're shouting to the devil. It hasn't happened. So <laughs> they've just come home with candy and said, oh, we met the neighbors and we got this candy from them. Great. You know, anyway, yeah. I just think we have to be exercising wisdom. Yeah. I wish I could say I have an answer for every situation that you could just apply, yeah. but you need to be wise, right? That's you need to be wise. So if a fool is being foolish, sometimes we're told, do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. So if a fool is being foolish, I don't want to go and answer him according to his folly. Um, sometimes I'm told in the very next verse, by the way, in Proverbs, <laughs> um, you know, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Okay, well, which one is it? Do I answer him according to his folly or do I not? Well, you have to make a wisdom call. Yeah. My oldest child found that maddening, by the way, that those two <laughs> verses were right next to each other. Like, I'm pretty sure his head exploded the first time he noticed it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that doesn't surprise me. He's very intense. So <laughs> that's a good word. Right. Good word for once him. To get it right. Once to get it right. But and that's uh, I and earnest. And I think that's OK. But if I go around saying, well, you made the call to answer the fool according to his folly and I made the call not to. Um, yours was unchristian and mine was Christian. I just think that people are silly when they do that. We made different wisdom calls. Okay. Yeah. And you could give me your case for why you think I made the wrong wisdom call. And I think that's perfectly acceptable. And I should be willing to listen to that. But for you to draw a conclusion that your wisdom call was right and mine was wrong, um, just right on the surface without any discussion, just start claiming that without any discussion back and forth, I think is arrogance. Wisdom's justified by our children. So we'll see who's right and who's wrong. Hmm. Well, and there might even be a case where, you know, same situation and it's one person's job to answer the fool according to his folly and a different person's job to not. Correct. That's exactly right. That's a good point. Well, I wonder if some of this desire for the exact right answer too is just a lack of Patience. Like when you say wisdom is justified by her children, that requires patience. We have yep. to wait on outcomes like that. But I feel like everyone, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's like the age of the internet search. We just want the answer so quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, that's part of it. I think the other thing is the fundamentalist impulse that lies within any conservative Christian, which is I want to dot every I and cross every T and have every question answered. I can't, I can't leave anything ambiguous because. Now I have to make wisdom calls. I'm not sure if I'm making the right one. I just want to know what God wants me to do. And I want to know what all he wants all the other people in my church to do as well. <laughs> in every circumstance. So I, I feel safer. I feel safer. I feel safer. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And, and that comes out in conservative, let's say conservative cessationist circles like our own, where I don't believe in the ongoing perpetuity of, of the gift of prophecy or something. That comes out in, in our, our circles with kind of rationalistic arguments for why this is right and that's wrong and why this is always right and that's wrong with regard to wisdom calls I'm talking about, not the law. Or it comes out um, in a charismatic circle with regard to, you know, kind of an experiential call. Well, I have this experience with God and or he nudged me in this way. And so now I'm going to bind you with the same kind of thing. It doesn't really matter which way it's showing up, either way, it's it's going beyond the biblical authority we have to try to bind the conscience of another or our own so that we can just protect our kids from everything we're worried about. Mm -hmm. Which that's it's a strong impulse. Everybody who has children knows they want to protect them from any nonsense. So then how do I do that? Well, you know, to some degree, I want to say folly's bound up in the heart of a child. So it's already there. Like they were born that way. <laughs> here they come with all the foolishness, you know, <laughs> you're, you're, you're trying to help them, you know, walk in wisdom and, and drive out some of that foolishness, but, but you're not going to find the perfect answer to every question that, that keeps folly from being there. It was bound up in their heart from birth. Mm. So maybe our overprotection is wishful thinking sometimes. That's definitely wishful thinking. Once you have adult children, as you now know, <laughs> your um your charade of of having some kind of control has ended. <laughs> right? Yeah. You thought you had control and then they went away and now they're doing what they want to do. And you're like, oh, I don't have control anymore. 
And, and that's actually a little bit hard to take. Mm. So trying to unwind that as early as you can so that that moment isn't as devastating for you as a parent might be so, something wise to consider. <laughs> you know, mm. So. Mm. That's interesting. That's like I'm a whole like, nother episode. I know. I was like, that, <laughs> that is a real rabbit, rabbit chill. Whoa, wabbit. I'm sorry. I'm like, <laughs> and Looney Tunes or something that I could follow there because I'm like, I'm not sure how much control I really have at this point with three teenagers in the house. <laughs> pretty sure. All illusions are gone. I'm pretty sure I'm just along for the ride. <laughs> yeah, you're right about that. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm not even sure anyone's driving the car. No, that's not true. But um, <laughs> it feels close to that sometimes. Uh, uh, well, Misty, is there anything else you want us to cover before we wrap this up? Well, I think... Taking it back to social media discussion, but especially like sistership, where in in sistership, we are trying to provide a place for actual conversation. Yes. To realize that the goal isn't that then we're all walking in lockstep and we're all, the end of every conversation is that everyone agrees. Yeah. But by discussing ideas we all understand what we're thinking better, especially if we're talking to someone who does disagree and that can be okay. Yeah. I, I think that if you want actual friendships that are going to be helpful to you, then you need to have, and I don't mean this in the non-virtuous sense of curiosity, if it's possible to use the word virtue and curiosity together. <laughs> um, classically, it's obviously not, but you you have a kind of virtuous curiosity about why someone holds a different view than you because you might grow and learn from it yeah. mm -hmm. you know and those are the best friendships where you have friendships with people who you have the same fundamentals in agreement you hold those together but then the way it works out in wisdom decisions in in life doesn't always work out exactly the same and you're learning from each other that's mm -hmm. that's what's supposed to happen in a marriage by the way you come from two different family cultures and ideally if you both come from christian homes your parents had particular strengths and weaknesses, and hopefully in the marriage, you're bringing those things together to have a better home than either one of you were raised in, in that sense. Mm -hmm. Not so that one parent gets to determine how everything is done in that sense where you're not learning from each other. The same thing is true in your friendships. You grow up in different contexts. You've seen different wisdom calls made. You've had different ex life experiences. But if you're both walking with the Lord closely and holding to his word as your authority, now you're working out wisdom calls with those friends and iron sharpens iron. That's the point. You're supposed to be sharpening each other. The iron has to hit the iron, right? For it to be sharpened. It doesn't just, you know, it isn't, um, let's get everybody in a room to agree with this one person. And then, then we'll all be walking. That's called a cult. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> not a friendship, right? So yeah. Uh, well, I just think ultimately if everyone agreed on everything, it'd be very boring. What would we have to talk about? Yeah. I don't even know. So I appreciate being with Christians that have a variety of opinions and takes on different things. I just feel like I learn so much more than I would learn from just, you know, engaging in the whole echo chamber sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, even non-Christians, I feel like it's good to be challenged by them sometimes. Yeah. Not on my beliefs about God, but my beliefs about, you know, philosophical type beliefs. Yeah, there is this book of nature, right? Psalm 19. Yeah. Heavens declare the glory of God, the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day, pour forth speech, night to night reveals knowledge. God is revealing things in nature. Nothing redemptive, but truth. You can hear from, from people about the nature of a man or a woman from natural revelation that they're they're reflecting on it. So Plato in the Republic, you know, talks about how what follows democracy is tyranny. And we're looking around going, yeah, that looks right. So <laughs> and he's not a Christian, right? It's, it's yeah. okay. He can notice things about human life that are worth listening to and learning from. That's actually probably a great idea to end with. Mm -hmm. We don't need to be afraid of these conversations. Just try to have them in a godly manner. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for coming today, Chad. I appreciate this. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm I'm happy to be of help where I can. Well, you I think you were today. Yes. So thanks. This is a great conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys.
That's it for today. Thank you so much for listening and being a part of the Sisterhood of the Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, share it with a friend and then discuss it with her. This is a great way to continue the conversation. All of the books and things we mentioned today are linked in our show notes. Just go to scolaysisters.com slash SS128 to check it out. If you are interested in hosting a Scully Sisters local retreat this year, make sure you sign up soon. The clock is ticking. Our digital hostess kits are still available and you'll still get all of our helpful planning supplies already prepped for you. Go to scolaysisters.com slash time. That's scolaysisters.com slash T-I-M-E to register. In our next episode, Misty, Abby, and I kick off a four-part series on Charlotte Mason's habits. This isn't about habit training, but rather about what habits to train and why. We're starting off with physical habits, and they aren't what you might expect. Make sure you are subscribed because you don't want to miss this great conversation. Until then, we want to remind you once again that homeschooling is a marathon you need to run alone, so open up your eyes and look around you. Find your sisters. Hello. Sorry, I was swallowing my coffee. Um, hi. <laughs> Choke. Oh. Hello.